May we request, as usual, Pastor Praveen to lead us in the opening prayer. Let's pray. Father, we come to thy presence, Lord, thanking you for giving us this wonderful opportunity to come together and study your word of God. As we're going to study the New Testament survey, and as Sachin is going to lead us, Lord, I pray your special anointing may be upon him so that the words he speak, Lord, may bring clarity, enlightenment in our hearts and uh, may speak to us and may uh, reveal your glory to us and especially in us, oh Jesus. Lord, I pray that you bless the hearing so that we may be able to receive and perceive what you want to communicate to us. The time we are going to spend in discussion may, be, may bring glory to your name, Lord. The discussions we have may edify us, strengthen us, and equip us. Lord, your name be exalted through everything that we do in this hour. And we want to hear your voice through your servant. And uh, you be the master and you reveal yourself to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You. Thank you, Praveen. And a very good evening to all of you. Again, it's a pleasure to be back with you all. Uh, just a little logistic uh, information. Uh, every day we are having uh, dark clouds, but it's not raining. And since today uh, um, morning, the electricity at our place is quite fluctuating. So if at all you see uh, uh, I disappeared, uh, I'll be back in two minutes because it's not taking more than that time. But if it's take more time, I'll just uh, call up Praveen and inform you. Uh, today we will be uh, today we will study the book of Acts. So let me uh, share my screen. So let's start. So as you know, the book of Ark, uh, Acts is normally known as the Acts of the Apostles. But in real sense, it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit changing the world. That's how I would like to classify and many other um, uh, scholars would uh, state it so. So if you see Acts, uh, yeah. Acts serves as a bridge document that links the gospel to the New Testament letters. And here we learn about the fate of Christ's earlier, earliest followers, how they consolidate uh, the early church in Jerusalem and envision a mission that will send missionaries as far as Rome. Now Luke recounts the compelling story of the establishment of the first churches throughout the empire. Although his history does not comprehensively describe all the activities of all the apostles, he traces the spread of Christianity to Jew and Gentiles from every social stratum throughout the empire. His subject is God's salvation in Jesus Christ intended for all people, regardless of class or ethnicity. Now, while Luke writes his history for Theopolis and others, we, that means we ourselves, we discover ourselves in this narrative sense. You know, in Peter's word, he says, God's promise is for all who are far off and for all whom the Lord our God will call. So in one sense, in this uh, book, we'll discover ourselves as well. Now the book of Acts begins as the book of Luke does with an introductory preface for the book's patron. Almost everyone agrees that the first book is the gospel of Luke and that the same person wrote both books. Act contains echoes of the gospel including similar miracles. 
Now, uh, the chart from the author Mark Allen Powell in his book, Introducing the New Testament uh, on page 201, he shows the parallels between the uh, Luke Gospel and the uh, book of Acts. Now, this does not mean that Luke invented the stories just to make parallels. Rather, from the stories that he gathered, he selected some that were parallel and told the story in such a way so as to bring out the parallels. Now, in the same way, Luke and Acts is a two volume book or it's a two volume work and the books are often studied together. But there is one important difference and the difference between these two books is genre. Now, Luke is a bias focused on who Jesus is as illustrated by his deeds and saying, whereas Acts is a historia of the early church shown largely through the deeds and saying of Peter and then Paul. But there's also significant section about Stephen and a bit about Philip. The stories about the people serve the larger purpose of history. The story is here now, the story is no longer focused on one person, but on the gospel. Now, some commentators outline the book of Acts geographically using formula Jesus gave to his disciples. That is, you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, as we read in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Although Luke begins the story in Jerusalem, he does not stick to a precise geographical sequence. Now, Philip's work in Samaria, as covered in Acts chapter 8, is described before Peter works in Judea, as we see it in Acts chapter 9. Now, later, the story moves back and forth from Antioch to Jerusalem, from Europe to Asia and back to Jerusalem, etc. Now, the book ends with Paul in Rome, which was the center of the Roman Empire, not the ends of the earth. So one uh, point to note here is now geography is important to Luke, but it is not the only thing that gives structure to his story. Now, Luke is telling the story of how Christian gospel spread from Jerusalem to Rome. And now while, while he is doing that, he is able to achieve some additional purposes as well. Through the speeches of his major characters, he presents the gospel. Now, several sermons in Acts contain concise description of the gospel. Now, most of the uh, sermon, they argue, that Jesus is the Messiah. He fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies. God raised him from the dead. He is the answer to Jewish and Gentiles hope. And this should call for a response of faith and repentance from people. You will find throughout uh, these um, ideas in most of the sermons. A major goal here is to explain, explain why Christianity was becoming more Gentile than Jewish. Now, Luke stresses the connection that, that Christianity has with the Jews and with Old Testament and explain how God and the reason Jesus directed the message to extend to all the nation as it is predicted in the Old Testament. Jesus fulfills the hope and needs of Gentiles as well as of that of Jews. Christianity. <clears throat> now, Luke may have had a political objective too, uh, to his, uh, the way he wrote. This is to show that Christianity was not a threat to the Roman government. Although riots sometimes broke out when the gospel was preached. Now, and Luke notes that the problem was not a problem were caused by either Jews or Gentiles, but not by the Christian preachers. Even the Roman officials repeatedly find Paul innocent of any wrongdoing, and then they just allowed him to continue 
the gospel to be preached. The story of Acts also revolves around people. Peter is the main protagonist in the first part of the book, as we see in chapter from chapter 1 to 12, while Paul becomes the central figure in the second part of the book, as we read from chapter 13 till 28. And the lives of these two opposites are parallel repeatedly. If you, if you see this table, you will see that more or less uh, Luke, in a way of his writing style, you would see the way he covers uh, ministry of Peter's is similar to, you will see the ministry of Paul. Now, in matters of Christian life, Luke emphasizes repentance, faith, baptism and forgiveness of sins. But he says a very little about specific sins. He emphasizes that the Holy Spirit gives believer the courage to faithfully witness to Jesus Christ in the face of persecu persecution. And he also stresses about prayer, asking God for help and thanking him for his deliverance. Now about date, when it's possibly uh, written. Now it's not possible uh, to date the writing of this book, except from the fact that we know that it was written somewhere at least two years before Paul was put into prison, as we read it in Acts chapter 28 verse 30, which gives us a, a date of composition of around AD 62. Now Luke knew whether Paul died or whether he was released, but Luke doesn't tell us which one happened. He could have a literary reason to omit either outcome. So that is his way of saying. Now let's move on to the next aspect, the historical accuracy of the book of Acts. Now Acts has been criticized by some scholars, particularly in comparisons to the letters of Paul. Now one problem is that Luke theology is not as same as Paul's. Now Luke barely mentioned uh, the atonement uh, salvation by the death of Christ and justification by faith. For him, he gives much stress to the resurrection of Jesus. Now, this illustrates that there are more than one way to preach the gospel. There is no one set formula that has to be followed. Uh, the author Powell's, he point out another theological uh, difference. In, in Acts, he says, I have not put it up. He says, we hear almost nothing about the spirit's role in generating faith or in effecting an inner purification of the believers. In Acts, we see the emphasis rather is on the power and external manifestation. So, some scholars say the book was probably not written by anyone who traveled with Paul. That's also a theory. It must be, they believe, it must be someone pretending to be a companion of Paul, inventing the V sections of the act as a part of vivid writing style. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the writing style in a little later. Since the letters are primary sources written by one of the participant, uh, uh, one of the participants, an act is a secondary source. So the letter is considered as a primary source and an act is considered as a secondary source. And perhaps written, um, perhaps decades later, the, the epistles or the letters carry most weight. That's why they felt um, the accuracy of um, Acts is in question. However, we have to see one thing. Even if Luke did not repeat Paul's theology, it is still possible for him to be an accurate historian. Okay? Indeed, the one place that Luke talked about forgiveness, that is justification by faith, is in his speech he attributes to Apostle Paul, as we read in uh, Acts chapter 13. Uh, it is unrealistic to expect, expect that Luke's summary of Paul's uh, evangelistic speeches will have the same emphasis as Paul's letter uh, written to the people who were already Christians. So that, that, that's the difference. Indeed, the speeches in act that sound most like Paul's letter uh, uh, in his speech to Christians 
as to the towards the efficient elders uh, in Acts chapter 20. So what we need to derive, we need to derive is that we must let Luke be Luke and not a clone of Paul. He has his own uh, way of bringing in the theology. Now, even in the historical method, there is no reason to give automatic acceptance to Paul merely because he is a primary source. That's another assumption. He could have biases of his own and his self-reported chronologies are given in a context of self-defense where he might have a reason to emphasize certain things and omit other details. That could be uh, Paul's prerogative. Luke may have not mentioned Paul's letter simply because he was unaware of how significant they would later became. And he felt no need to mention those documents which Theopolis could not obtain. And hence, possibly he did not mention about uh, Paul's letters. Some scholars, sometimes they say that Luke was writing in the style of Greek histo historiography. What is that? Where people were not terribly concerned about the truth and gave writer the freedom to invent speeches, however they please, okay? more as a demonstration of author's skill than any biases in truth. Part of rhetorical training in the Greco-Roman world was called as declamatory exercises in which a student made up speeches for this or that famous person or this or that occasion. But since act has many speeches and lot of additional direct discourse, these scholars take it all with a grain of salt. Luke wasn't present uh, for the speech of Stephen, for example. So he likely made up the whole thing as some of the scholars says. Now scholars also argue about the speech of Stephen. Some saying that it is a complete fabrication. Other argue that there must be a source behind it since part of it does do not mesh well with Luke's emphasis. It has a semantic style that would have been so difficult for Luke to fake. The, 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 uh, if you read uh, Stephen's uh, speech in detail, you will see that. There is nothing improbable about the early Christians remembering this trauma in their history. And even uh, Paul, might have remembered what angered him so much. So Moreland, another author, he argues that act was written at an early date, early date uh, when the accuracy of such claims could have been easily checked and verified. And in his argument uh, of why acts was written in the early date, and he gives following argument. First, uh, he says, Acts does not mention the fall of Jerusalem, despite frequent references to that city, nor does he mention political turmoil in Judea or the beginning of the war. That happens uh, AD 70 onwards. Acts does not mention the second point, the persecutions of Nero, the attitude towards Rome uh, in, in the book of Acts is favorable. It's not hostile. And the third reason he gives is act does not mention the death of James, Paul or Peter. Another author called Hamer, he points out that acts like John has numerous local details like place names, people names, time span, etc. Which is indirect evidence that the author was really present there. For example, he knew what sailor did in a storm because he himself was part of one. He had very, uh, um, he, I'm referring to Luke, had very little reason to invent his own presence when he doesn't even identify himself. You'll always see we. Nor does he claim to be present in all the events. So he just sometimes show, shows up uh, unobtrusively when he used the word we. Now, another fact, uh, we are still going through the historical accuracy of Acts. So another fact about Acts that argues Luke accuracy is the large gap in time 
in which Luke reports only generalized summaries. You will see, you will see very less summaries across the long time span. Now he does not feel at liberty to invent uh, and speeches for those times. So he likely, the likely reason for this gap is that Luke had no information for such period, which suggests that he did not have uh, anything to report. Or second, uh, he could not uh, check uh, what happened. Now, we don't think that Luke gives us a word for word report of exactly what was said. Very important. We don't think that Luke gives us a word for word report of what exactly was said. He has shortened every speech. And if an earlier speech uh, has covered something, he does not feel a need to repeat the same points in the later speech, we see. Even though on actual occasion, points may have been repeated for similar audiences. Like uh, who knew the full version of Paul's um, Luke, who knew the full version of Paul's conversion story, felt free to tell it in different ways at different times. Like for example, Luke gives us three accounts of Paul's experience to the road to Damascus. Now, the differences illustrate the liberties that Luke can take in reporting the events for different situations. And we as a readers have to allow for such flexibility when it comes to other stories that the biblical writers give us. Now, in general, we can be confident that act is historically accurate. Although we cannot press for every detail, nor does the message hinge on such details. Okay? The message is rooted in history, but it is not dependent on history. Luke has selected events that help show Christian doctrine and practices. He has omitted fact that might confuse the reader, like for example, regarding circum uh, circumcision. For example, he says there was a heated debate as we read it in Acts chapter 15 verse 2. But he reports the argument of only one side of the controversy. What Luke writes is true, but it is also theologically selective because he has nothing to say uh, on what the other side says. He also have, uh, uh, he says nothing about Paul's problem uh, in Corinth and Galatia. Acts tells us how Christianity began and spread in one part of the empire. One part of the empire. Now, Luke does not tell us how the gospel spread in Egypt or went east uh, into Meso uh, uh, Mesopotamia and India. Now, no history book ever has enough space to tell all the facts. The historian must select the facts that are most important and the events that played critical roles in the development of later situations. The historian must interpret the facts and present them in an organized way. And Luke does that very well. With literary skills, he gives numerous details and interesting personality sketches that helps us understand what happened. Acts has both history and faith. For readers today, the book serves as an important link between Gospels and the Epistles. It as it bridges the gap between Jesus of the history and the Christ of faith. In the Gospel, Jesus is preaching, while as in the Epistles, Jesus is being preached. And the book of Acts explain how the messenger became the center of the entire message. This is particularly important as we read the epistles of Paul, because without the book of Acts, we would not know who Paul was or how he entered the picture or what motivated him to preach to Gentiles or why he wrote to such, uh, why he wrote to such far places. So book of Acts plays a very crucial role. 
Luke gives us glimpses into the personalities of Paul, Peter, John and James who wrote other New Testament books. He shows us the remarkable transformation that the Holy Spirit produced in Peter who went on from denying Jesus three times to boldly defying the Jewish leaders and telling them to their faces that he would continue to preach about Jesus. And that's also the core, uh, not core, a very uh, prominent uh, theme in, in my message in the coming Sunday um, about the empowerment of the Holy Spirit as we witness. Now, the sudden boldness of the apostles is the testimony that God raised Jesus from the dead and gave this fisherman the drastic conviction and power. Now, Luke also records the persecutions of Peter, the martyrdom of Stephen and James, the stonings and beating and imprisonment of Paul. Whether they lived or died, captive or free, these Christians were led by the Holy Spirit to testify that Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior. The book of Acts may be read for history and it also be read to strengthen our faith and commitment to Jesus Christ. That's a very crucial role it played then and it's playing now. Now as we, one second. Now, as we read, we can put ourselves in the apostle's sandal to feel their boldness in preaching the gospel. We can feel their fears when facing persecution. We can marvel that the apostles right after being flogged, they're rejoicing because they have been counted worth, worthy of suffering. Disgrace for the name of Jesus, as we read it in Acts chapter 5, verse 41. By reading about their faith and perseverance, we can be emboldened to face our own crisis with the help of the Holy Spirit. Now, the we see the next uh, area that is the narrative genre. Now, what is narrative genre? The dictionary defines as the main purpose of this genre is to entertain through the storytelling and to engage the reader in an imaginative experience. Typical example of narratives that children will encounter take the form of like fairy tales, myth and legend. So the book of act is like a storytelling. That's a narrative genre. Now Luke tells us what happened, but he rarely indicate what should happen today. For example, he tells us that the seven men uh, were chosen to wait on table as we read it in Acts chapter 6 from verse um, 1 to 6. But he does not tell us whether the churches today should follow the same example. The book of Acts is descriptive. It's not prescriptive. It is history. It is not law. And this creates a challenge in how we are to use it. All histories are selective. Luke has selected histories to um, select the stories that serve his purpose. And his goal was, number one, to give information about how the church grew from Jerusalem to Rome. One of the first goal. The second goal is to explain how the Christian movement included Gentiles as well as Jews. The third goal to let the apostle uh, speeches present the gospel to do this in an entertaining way and to inspire the readers to have confidence that God is behind this new religious movement. And that's why some call this a theological history. Look, tell us about the teaching, that is the doctrines of the apostolic church, sometimes indirectly, sometimes directly. Now, did Luke expect his readers to recreate the events of the miracles that he mentioned in the book of Acts? Probably not. Much of it is not repeatable. 
Now we cannot call down the tongues of fire on anyone's head, nor do we know anyone who do this or tries to do that. Uh, but some of the modern uh, Christians do attempt to replicate other portions of Acts. Now why they pick one and why they miss other is, is cannot be explained. Sometimes they think that the first century church is the model to imitate. They think the first century church is the model to imitate as if they were perfect back then. But there are a couple of uh, things wrong with these assumptions and let me share those. First, Luke is selective in which stories he tell. He does not include all the troubles in Corinthians that we learn about from Paul's letter. Uh, he does not mention the troubles in Galatia, nor does he mention those who were sick, who died, or who had abandoned the faith. Yeah? So that's he is selective in uh, sharing the story. The second act, uh, aspect is God is still with the church and because of that we should expect that the church would generally get better. It will never remain there, it will always get better, not worse over the centuries. The church has always had problems. The factions and the doctrinal diversity we have today have also existed in one form or another. As far as we can, uh, we can tell, they did had in the first century as well those problems. Starting with the complaint about Greek speaking widows as we read it in Acts chapter 6. Now, when we compare our own churches with the miracles Luke described, we should not get discouraged at how far we fall short. Yeah, the, the, the frequency uh, and, and the volume and the impact of the miracles, uh, when we see that and compare with our churches, we should not get discouraged. Because the whole intention of Luke, he wants us to be encouraged not discouraged for we all know he reported 100% of the miracles and very few of the boring ordinary happenings. Now, miracles were extraordinary back then just as it is now. Miracles do happen and because God is still with us but we should not expect the evidence for that will be identic identical to what it was in the first century very important. We should not compare with the volume, with the numbers and the impact of the miracles we have today with that of the uh, church in the first century. Now Luke reports a variety of miracles, not pattern, that were repeated in every city that Paul went to. Now stories do not necessarily teach doctrinal truths. You see, this is a narrative genre, the book of Acts. So the stories do not necessarily teach doctrinal truth. Although Luke includes some sermons uh, that teach truths, rather stories are meant to engage the emotions of the readers. So what did Luke wanted? Luke wanted his readers to have faith in Jesus. This was the primary purpose of his first book. And the second um, uh, expectation is to have faith that God, Jesus and the Spirit was guiding the early church church's work, especially in the expansion from Jews in Jerusalem to the Gentiles in Rome. Now this was the purpose of Luke's writing. But does this mean that the Luke's purpose could have been achieved in just one paragraph the way I, I mentioned? No. because most of the readers uh, back then or now would not accept these points if they were not, uh, if they are just stated so simply. These points need evidence to back them up. And the stories in Acts provides that evidence to this message. They are organized in a way to be rhetorically effective, to touch the emotion, not to list the facts. Now, we may believe that the Bible is infallible, 
but do we believe that the early church was infallible as well i hope not luke tell us that some believers had wrong beliefs about what gentiles believers were supposed to do did some of the believers also had wrong actions of course yes ananias and sapphira were killed for what they did but none of the believers were perfect luke is writing a history and history can describe whatever mistakes were made luke correctly describes what they did but that does not always mean that they were doing the correct thing for example in 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 retrospect it may not have been wise for paul to participate in the temple rituals as we read it in acts chapter 21 verse 26 now luke tells us that believers in judea did not claim private ownership of any possessions but everything they own was held in common as we read it in chapter 4 does luke imply that believers ought to do this today if so he did not mention or he did not made it clear how now uh, ananias and sapphira were killed for lying not for withholding their part of money as we read it in chapter 5 peter implied that they had the right to use the money however they saw fit it would be it would not be a sin to keep it nor does luke give any evidence that this communal approach was being implemented in the other cities or in the other churches in the other cities so what is luke trying to convey with his story he is saying it is that extraordinary times include extraordinary actions just as there are various miracles in the story that need not be repeated for every believers or every church some of the responses of the people are likewise one time events based on the circumstances that are not repeatable repeatable uh, repeated in the other places and other times luke would be happy if theopolis shared all his money with the poor but he is not telling theopolis or other believers that they must do the same and give it everything they own to the poor now should all believers speak in tongues now that's a miracle that occurred several times in luke's story but it happens in a different way each time now must we must remember that luke is not trying to give us some formula how to make it happen instead he is using this extraordinary event to tell us that god approved of each of this step in the story of church expansion luke gives us variety variety in a way the gospel is preached variety in a way the churches were organized and make decisions variety in a way people responded to the gospel these are instructive they are not normative there is no command that we should follow any of the particular pattern luke is telling us what they did he is not saying what theopolis or anyone else should do in the future very important now for most uh, part narratives are good source of material uh, narratives are not good source of material for doctrines or command because primary function as we read it is storytelling now the speeches uh, of peter and paul although embedded in a narrative are not themselves a narrative and hence they include uh, exhortations and they are more directly useful now the story in acts may illustrate various doctrines but those doctrines are usually better grounded on other genres such as the epistles the most important use of acts may be that it introduces us to paul and gives us a context for reading his epistles and hence in in, in the next uh, session that we're going to cover we are going to see who is this paul as a person and how did he come to understanding of grace and how does the gospel move uh, through him 
to Gentiles. That's the, the uh, session for us today about Acts, uh, how it was written, what it was intended, how God used uh, events uh, like miracles, uh, speaking in tongues to expand the, uh, the church in the first century, uh, just through the book of Acts, not later. And we also saw how, uh, how um, God uses people, how the Holy Spirit empowered the people, gave them power to face the uncertainties and yet be very confident of what they stand for. That's something we need to uh, take it from the book of Acts. That's it from uh, today's sharing. I'll stop my screen and then we will move on to some discussion comments. If I have answer with me right now, I'll share. Else I'll go back and uh, get back to you. So that's from my side. Over to you all. Sachin, let me kick off the discussion. Sure. First, uh, first a comment and then a question. <clears throat> I think the you, the point you made on the fact that the events of the book of Acts is not repeatable, I think is a, a very, very important point. Uh, so many of us today in the 21st century think that everything that happened in Acts must you know, be repeated today in our churches. And I think uh, they make a big mistake. I heard uh, one person say that in those days, the church turned the world upside down. And uh, he was expecting <laughs> the same to happen today. But today the church is only being persecuted. Right? So anyway, I thought I'll just make that comment. That's a very good point. Uh, but uh, a question now, I think when you were discussing Luke and Paul's theology, uh, in that context, you mentioned that there are more than one ways to preach the gospel. So I was just wondering, um, are you saying that you can preach the gospel by preaching Christ and as well as allow personal testimony and the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives also to be a way of preaching the gospel? Just wanted to ask uh, what were the uh, what were some of the points that can be included in preaching the gospel? Okay, I think that's a very important question. As we go out to witness uh, and we share the gospel, the, uh, for, uh, this is my opinion uh, of, of so far what I have gathered. The main story and the character of the gospel is Jesus Christ, what he has done for us and uh, through him, we are reconciled with God to have a forever relationship with him that was broken. Correct. This is the, the main story of the gospel. But as I rightly said, the gospel or the word of God always produces a response. And before we ask that response from somebody else, the best way to show is the response that we had given. And that is where, as you rightly said, the personal testimonies right? The personal uh, testimony is how the life is transformed. Now, normally what often, uh, and I would not um, put it a blanket statement, but we often, when we share the gospel, it's more on the blessing or the miracles or the healings that we had, we share. I'm not saying that is wrong because we as that's what we experience, which is okay. But what is more important is how the gospel has transformed us how it's transforming us and how that zeal of transforming us is now pushing us to connect with others that would but the story remains same uh, that is the center of everything but our response would then help those with whom we are sharing the gospel to then see how they are responding because now as we always in in gci we mostly this thing is we participate in what Jesus is doing through the spirit. So to those people whom we are sharing, Christ is already there with us. We are just sharing our response and probably helping them to create their own response in their own ways. Does that help? 
Yes, Sajjan, I think uh, uh, the way we manifest our response, uh, I think is vital uh, because there's no point in expecting others to respond when we ourselves are responding in a, in a, in a, in a false way or in, in a bad way. <laughs> Yeah, that's 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 good. Yeah. Okay, folks, any comments or questions? Sachin is uh, will be more than happy to help you. Yes, Rekha. Go ahead. Well, I was thinking that uh, because Luke was Greek, his vision would be a little different. Of course, the main story is always there. Jesus is our Lord. But we all, as even now, from different cultures we come and we do think a little differently from each other. So uh, we will not think exactly like the Hebrews thought. We would think of it a little different, but at the same time stick to the main story. And that's what I think Luke did here. Yeah. Absolutely. You see the, his historian, um, uh, what do you say, characteristics, is, yeah. is a way of putting the things together. Luke, uh, we saw the uh, the parallels of Luke in the book of Acts. We also saw the parallels of um, Peter and Paul. His way of putting the things together, his way of choosing the things and then letting the story flow. So you're right on that part, yes. Yes, Yes, Bertie. Yeah, thanks, uh, Pastor Sachin, for you know keeping to the Word of God and the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And as Mr. Zechariah said, if we don't uh, manifest ourselves, you know how the transformation God has brought about in our own lives, and uh, we are false in some respect of whatever falling short. How can we even, you know, uh, how can we reach out to others? Uh, Pastor Sachin, uh, I think somebody mentioned that you are into evangelism uh, in the sense that you are making, uh, you're doing uh, intentional evangelism or uh, what do you call it? Um, you are uh, doing it uh, to a category of people. Uh, maybe you can just clarify it uh, it, uh, are you doing it in what is called the slum area, or, or uh, how do I how do I understand it? Maybe you may want to clarify it. You know, we all are called to be evangelistic, yeah, but uh, certain people have the office of uh, uh, of an ev uh, of evangelism, and they are especially used by the Holy Spirit to you know to impact or to reach out to people whom God is whom the Holy Spirit is sending you to. And we all call to, of course, share, live and share the faith and share the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, how are, maybe briefly, could you just tell us, are you targeting the slum, this thing? I don't know whether I heard it right, or maybe you need to. Targeting the slum, uh, you know, the slums uh, where you're taking the gospel to, or maybe it is uh, not, not just, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, the slums are the target people. Uh, it's it is uh, you know done in a broader sense. Could you just clarify it? Yeah. So thank you, Bertie, for that. I think uh, Bertie is bringing it out from our previous uh, conversation on what sort of outreach activity we do uh, where we are associated with the local church here in Pune. And I think it is an, an extension. Uh, that question is an extension of that. So Bertie, earlier I'll tell you my experience. The church, of course, is involved in multiple avenues, but how uh, I felt. Uh, connected and how God called me. There, there are two very in, interesting things I would like to share. I felt I spent majority of my time into industry, I mean working. So I would be able to associate myself with the working professional well and hence I'll be able to share that within the, the, the pressures, within the challenges of working environment, how it is still possible uh, to live a godly life and, and help each other, strengthen each other. Uh, testify how God has been in different situation and I felt this is where primary my uh, outreach would be 
but i was surprised when uh, with just when we returned back to india the local church said listen you can talk marathi right so we are going out to the uh, outskirts of pune to the small villages and i want you to speak because sub- they had only one pastor who speak marathi and now i am the second person who did and most of them were hindi and we are primarily a english church and that was a big challenge because i cannot converse in marathi i can answer you one sentence or so i was so difficult for me but then uh, i st- and then they started give me an exposure to to share uh, testimony and message with them 5 to 10 minutes and slowly i started finding myself uh, writing the whole message in english then converting into marathi finding the marathi verses but then the way i started connecting with them that became my joy and within no time i realized that i started loving that so whenever now they have two three other churches who are associated and their primary uh, communication is marathi they love to call me and i love to be there and share that uh, uh, with them which whatever god has put in my heart so in that way now my the marathi skills are being used to reach out to the outskirts villages where uh, this is happening so to whom we are developing so that's how berti two avenues uh, i am involved whereas the church has other avenues but two are majorly where i am contributing myself does that answer thank you so much yes so the saying comes true the gospel is going to the ends of the earth <laughs> Right. We've got about eight minutes left. You s- still have opportunity to ask any question or make any comments. Anything from the Book of Acts, especially doctrinal wise, because that is something that uh, lots of people struggle with. Uh, they feel that uh, Acts sets doctrine, which I think uh, very clearly, uh, it, it's many things are not repeatable. Well, while people are thinking, uh, Sachin, I'll, I'll slip in another question. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think um, you you made one statement uh, that acts uh, seem to indicate that I mean to say uh, shows that Jesus is the answer to Jews and Gentiles' hope, Jewish and Gentile hope. We know the Jewish hope was the Messiah would return and the kingdom would be established. regarding the gentiles would it be um, identified as the hope of the gentiles is to be included in the promise of god to become a people of god i mean i'm just wondering what what was the hope that might be uh, indicated by the book of acts very interesting just as as you were speaking i was wondering i, I just step myself in. just imagine let's all of us go into the first century now gentiles either we have many gods correct now here we are seeing this monotheist uh, religion uh, as uh, my previous course was hebrews and we were seeing how they were the early the, the converted christians were being forced into judaism because of the persecution that was happening uh, during the time of nero and other jewish were so here they see a one p- perfect religion they see one god and now uh, people are sharing with us that listen this whole privilege thing you are included yeah in the hope and has the equal uh, right of access through christ as they had huh? as a ch- children of god because you see the, some of the terms were very specific to the jews right the children of god or the almighty god the one, or the one and the only god the creator of heaven and earth and now he has just a privilege of that uh, being associated included in that hope through christ i think that was just an amazing thing for them i think that was just the concept of hope to there i think that and, and through the power of holy spirit they were able to stand uh one uh, as we later we, we travel little later in ad 70 and later we will see that the persecution was happening from their own families also uh and persecution was also happening 
from the Jew side because that time you need to have a religion. And Christianity in AD 70 was not a religion where you can say I am a Christian. So that's why people were being forced and persecuted to go back to Judaism. I, I think that was an amazing thing for them. What an hope to stand in this thing. And the whole uh, uh, the book of uh, Hebrews, then that's such a great encouragement for both the Jews and the Gentiles. One thing uh, I would like to ask the questions. Yeah. Now we just seen that uh, and, and the studies uh, that I did, we said that uh, the events and the, uh, the things, the circumstances in act that happen is, are not repeatable. But we have often seen many of the churches try to take the principles out of it. Like for example, they share the possession. What we take uh, is the principle of sharing. If we have, I need to share with uh, our brethren. So, my question is, how uh, how valid or right it is to principalizing the events of the uh, acts in the current scenarios? What is your opinion? Then you should start and then people will add to it. Yes. How, how is principalizing is correct to what level principalizing we should do or sometimes we go too far while principalizing it. Yeah, this is an important question you have asked. I understand. I, I feel uh, uh, what you have said, what just now Pastor made comments, uh, actually uh, they bo both of them are uh, related. Uh, Pastor said a statement like uh, uh, the things that happen in Book of Acts, so they are not repeatable. Uh, it is not necessary that it, it is not repeatable, means in all senses it is not repeatable. One of the examples he said was a, a church, uh, the ancient days in the early church, uh, they turned the world upside down. Okay, uh, so of course, uh, we may not need to take the one aspect of it and uh, make the turn the world upside down, which many of the people are trying to do and we're making fun of uh, Christianity. But at the same time, church plays a major role. And in fact, God has chosen the church as a, his agent or represents uh, representatives of his kingdom. So church has to be dynamic. Church has to be dynamic. It should function as dynamic. And God is going to walk through the church dynamically. And uh, he is going to release, uh, re reveal his power and glory uh, through the church. In that sense, uh, definitely church, uh, though it is first century, second century, third century, in its own way, in its own uh, fashion, church has influenced the world and we should be in a position to influence the world. Otherwise, there is no point in calling ourselves as the body of Christ or, or the um, representatives of the kingdom of God. Uh, that does not mean we have to do everything that the first century uh, church have done. Uh, we, we, you know, as you said, a very good word uh, that is Holy Spirit and God is working with the, with the church. That's why we can be hopeful. Uh, in that sense, we are becoming better and better, uh, though there are some uh, failures we have. So coming to uh, the kind of question you asked about taking the principles from the first century church, absolutely. We have to take the principles from the first century church, otherwise we do not have any guide. Uh, the, so uh, it is uh, it is good it is good that uh, we should uh, we should be focused and dependent on the scripture which is inspired word of God what God has revealed and bringing out principle out from them is much better than bringing out moralistic ethical uh, perspectives or principles that are developed by the human humans uh, examples we all know the most humanistic thoughts how they have resulted we know the feminism we know which is fight for equality how it ended up so we all we always have to bring our principles and take our principles from the church from the gospel uh, gospel of course there may be some new principles which may be related to the gospel uh, which are consistent with the gospel message of the gospel and what happened in the church i guess that would be helpful but it is not uh, what they have done exactly we have to copy I, it's it doesn't work in there, we need to take 
like you know apostle paul says we need the spirit gives life and the word kills similarly even book of acts events if you try to copy them as they are and it, they are going to uh, present as idiots and fools but we need to take the spirit behind it the message behind it the principle behind it behind those actions and uh, practices i guess that that is something uh, gives us a direction towards how a church should function very important thank you so much yes bertie you have a follow up comment on what pravin said uh pastor pravin has brought it out very beautifully and we were all at least i was wanting to uh, when you asked the question which uh, like what principles we should take i probably would like to uh, um, uh, like to vocalize or like to express it that we all belong to christ we are guided by the holy spirit and we are living the kingdom life kingdom of god and uh, what pastor praveen uh, you of course you are doing it in your own life you are knowing about it and uh, uh committed to it and and as pastor praveen you know elaborated in what it is that's why they say you know, we have to make a difference uh, in uh, you know in the world uh, we cannot be seen as you know uh, one of one of, uh, you know one of the one of the other fellows you know like uh, uh, worldly or try to compromise or try to you know uh, not know what the kingdom of god really means what we are called to be kingdom citizens you know we are citizens of the kingdom of god we are called to be we even now we have christ in us he is our king he is a god our ruler we trust in him we love him we depend upon him and as uh, pastor pravin said we have to depend upon the word of god and thanks to you to pastor uh, pastor zachariah and pastor pravin who are you know basing your uh, bible studies and uh, sermons uh uh rightly on the word of god but i would like to uh, uh if my one if i can just suggest that we uh, always keep uppermost in the mind that we are called out of the world into the body of christ and that's that's what we should all know and that we are now you know we are in christ and the holy spirit is moving us as you say in outreach and in uh, you know being faithful to the doctrine the teaching then as pastor pravin says we you know we have to learn from the holy spirit guided by the holy spirit be christ like and live the my point is live the kingdom of god life so maybe in the days to come and all you know uh, maybe uh, we can have a series of uh, the life of what you know in the in the light of god's word sure. definitely you know uh, definitely um, uh, founded on the word of god about the life of what you know christ would like to see us live and we are as you know we are dependent upon christ and we want the christ god says you are to you know the, the holy spirit is conforming us more to christ okay. and this christ said i'm not of this world if i you know i'm i'm he is greatly said i overcome the world we are called to be overcome and we are so thankful to christ that he is in us yeah. but you know, the life of the kingdom of god uh, maybe some a series of uh this thing uh, maybe uh, bible studies could help us all maybe to correct our misunderstanding uh, to even to awaken us from you know from uh, you know uh, from uh, being not committed to the christian way of life no i think that's a very important point you brought bertie thank you so much and i think we have such a uh, rich um, Uh, information and and documentation on the kingdom of god uh, through our theologists our own gca theologist dr gary dado and i believe uh, sometime in the future myself or uh, pravin would love to bring that because almost in every uh, course we do we always catch up on that oh oh uh, mio in the future would bring that to us so we'll do that buddy thank you so much uh, i think we have already crossed the time And, and in my sunday message i would start off with in continuation to my wednesday message because most of it i uh, i started the the foundation uh, so i hope uh, you all would join so as we continue with the empowerment process uh, on, on on the sunday so with yeah. that i would uh, request just, yes bertie yeah just allow, maybe you can involve the members you know uh, as we attend the bible study on zoom maybe to give their testimonies and you know how they are practicing uh, you know the principles or how they are you know uh, growing in christ likeness i'm sure 
uh, Surya Muthi, Mr. Zakaria, <laughs> Mr. Absolutely. Rao, yourself, yeah. you know, yourself, your dad, and you know, you know, our journey, uh, how it has a uh, particular principle, you know, has been, you know, Christ-like. Uh, oh, yes. Teaching, yeah, teaching the yeah. word of, how it's helping in us and how we have uh, learned to know and grow in it. You know, maybe you can call upon some people in advance, tell them to give a testimony where we can benefit from, you know, uh, from uh, the uh, living the kingdom way of God life. And that's an excellent idea, Boiti. Absolutely. Uh, every time we sit with you all, there's so much of encouragement. And I believe if that's extended to a larger group, what an amazing thing. Yeah, you'll get, a, you'll get to take a pause <laughs> Correct. Correct. during a study or uh, maybe even in preaching also time, you know. Sure. Uh, preaching, of course, mostly they are live. Very few I see, uh, you know, on Zoom and maybe yeah. others on YouTube. In the, in the uh, thing of time, I think maybe we can request Pastor Dan to close today's uh, session with the word of prayer. And we continue to, uh, I would request Pastor Dan to pray that the Holy Spirit continue to empower us, transform us. Yeah. Throughout the week. Okay. Thank you, Sachin. Let's uh, conclude in prayer. Gracious, loving Father, we just thank you that you give us opportunity to uh, learn and grow. And through these discussions, uh, they are so uh, helpful that we uh, bring in various aspects and complete the picture. We are grateful to you, Lord, for giving us the desire to attend and having a desire to learn and continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that, Lord, the Holy Spirit continues to lead us as a fellowship, as a denomination, that we may indeed be lights for Jesus Christ, our Lord. Bless each one of us and uh, take care of our needs and continue to provide for us, Father, as we look to you in faith. We look forward to many more of uh, these discussions and we ask for your blessings upon us as we retire for the evening. Uh, may uh, your continued guidance be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.